Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Time just kind of creeps up on you, right? Next thing you know, it's time for service. We have we have a God that calls us into a relationship with Him that is genuine, which is important because there's a lot of things that are out there that are not genuine, things that are deceptive, especially in this world today. And what he says is that I'm looking for someone that truly has a heart um, that is genuine, that is committed to God, that reflects God's character. And so if you can stand before, uh, stand and we're going to worship our God here this morning. So. Oh 
moving in outlet. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in outlet. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, pulling in outlets. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God. That is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every life. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship Way back a miracle, miscape, light in the 
Feel it. 
uh, ascended to heaven, even within years after that, you've already got deceptions. You've already got people that are planting in heresy, planting things that are not true to the faith. And they're misleading people down paths that are not a full um, a fullness of what God had intended for us through Christ. And that's a problem. And I know when I was growing up, part of the thing that, that bothered me was that I... I saw a lot of people that were around me and also even myself that were doing the things that the church was telling us to do and yet we still felt empty. And all of the scripture that talked about victory in Christ and yet always felt defeated. And I know that faith isn't all about emotion, but it's part of it. And some people just totally throw it out. They say it's all an intellectual. You do have to understand God's word. And God's word does guide us into truth. But also Christ talks about the power and the ability that we have to overcome that which comes against us. And this is what John is talking about here. And this is what he's getting at uh, in his scripture. How do you know what's real? How do you know a real faith? How do we know if we are truly in Christ? How do we know that? And so this is what he is addressing here. And there's a couple of things that are really important for us to understand before we get into the text here today. John, first of all, last week we saw that John starts off his letter and he, he says, um, he basically establishes authority from himself. And he says, I have the authority to share this with you because God revealed this to me personally, along with the other apostles. And we have fellowship with God. We know him intimately. We've seen him. We've touched him. We've heard from him. Specifically, he has shown us and told us exactly what the fullness of his salvation is all about. And I'm going to share that with you. And so fellowship is what it's all about. He says, I'm going to show you and lead you into this fellowship so that you can enjoy the fellowship that we have also with God. It's a relationship. And Jesus even talks about, we talked about last week, that eternal life, which he talks about all the time. He defines it in John 17, the Gospel of John 17, chapter, chapter 17, verse 3, where he says, this is eternal life, that they know you. The, and the one whom the Father has sent, Jesus Christ. The word know is very intimate knowledge. Very intimate. It's not just about. It's not that I read about him. We talked about and said that what if I, if I told you that I want to show you my wife and I pulled out a book. And I said, I've read all about her. She's wonderful. There's something huge that's missing. And that's the relational part of it. And, and that's what God calls us into is this relationship, this fellowship, which is amazing that we get a chance to be able to participate in. And so here's something that we need to back up to understand. In the very beginning, and I'm talking about, and this is something in the beginning is what John also references. He's talking about Jesus who was in the beginning. He's also referencing the beginning of time. He's also talking about the beginning of Jesus's ministry. But ultimately, in the beginning, God created humans in his image and likeness. That is essential for us to remember this. He created us in his image and likeness. We got a chance to walk. He walked with us. We lived in his presence. What an amazing thing that that is. We had that intimate relationship with him. We knew him. And the whole point of it was for us to also reflect him to all of creation, to know him and to reflect him, to be so in awe of what we saw and what we experienced with God that everything about him just overflowed from him into us and that all else saw God through us. In the ancient Near East, which is the whole biblical area, so everything from Egypt to Assyria and Babylon and so forth, it was customary back then for them to make images in the likeness of the king or pharaoh. And you still see that today. And what's kind of humorous is that you would see sometimes you would know that these some pharaohs were not, you know, manly 
and, and, and you know, uh, powering. Some of them had these big old pot bellies and stuff and were just really kind of um, slouchy and stuff. And, and yet, at the same point, you see these images that were made, these stone images that are these broad shoulders and, and pointing of the areas that they're going to conquer. And you see these gods that are behind them and on their shoulders and on their head and stuff. And all this power, those images were to portray especially in areas that they weren't able to be in when they conquered lands. They would make images. They would make stone images or metal images that had the likeness and the image of what they wanted to portray their king as. Some, most of the time it was strong and powerful and wise and conquering. Sometimes loving and merciful also at the same point. The point is, though, is this to reflect the image and likeness of the king in all the territory that he ruled over. God has done the same thing. But because God is a God, that his very name, Yahweh, means him whom life emanates from, the I am. I am life. I am a, everything emanates, life emanates from me. He is a living God. So he made images in his likeness. Living images. His images aren't of wood and stone. His images have flesh and a heart that beats and a life that lives. They have breath in them. In him is the spirit of God and spirit, wind, life. They are all spirit, wind, breath, thank you, are all the same word in Hebrew and also in Greek. Spirit, the life, the breath is in his images because he is spirit. He is life. He is the wind that lives in us. And we were supposed to reflect his image and likeness to all his territory, which is all of earth. It's awesome. But something happened in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, it shows us that these, these beings, humans that were meant to Enjoy God is the only beings in all of creation that had the ability to be able to see God, to live in his presence and to know him in such a way that they could enjoy him and share him. Because they were like him in his image and likeness. And these beings decided to not listen to his word, his instruction. Don't eat from this one tree. You have everything else. Everything else is yours. Don't eat from this one tree. Because we did not believe his word, we did not listen, have faith in his word. Satan planted a seed. God doesn't really truly want your best interest. He just doesn't want you to be like him in wisdom and knowledge. And so we doubted. We ate and sin came into the picture. And there was separation. That is essential for us to understand all of that because everything in the Bible as a result of that is about that. It's about that situation. It's about what God is doing with that situation because he even promises in that very same place, I'm not going to leave you there. Even though you are now going to be separated from me. There's separation, there's sin. I'm not going to leave you there. I will come back and I will give you what you need and provide for you. Also important for us to understand is this, is that God creates man from dust from the ground. His very name, Adam, means dirt man. Man from the dust dirt man. So that's what we are. Dirt people. We're made of the dust. We're made from the ground. And isn't it interesting that also in Genesis 3, what God curses is not Adam. It's the ground. It's the dust. He curses. The, not us. In general, he curses the very thing that we're made of. The most inner part of us is cursed. 
we are completely helpless to save ourselves. It's not just us pulling up our pants and, and getting over it. It's not just getting tough and, and figure things out. We are so lost, the very elements that we came from are cursed. The Creator Himself has to do something to be able to save us from the very thing that is killing us. And the other image that I want to, to just to share is the heart is an image that talks about this, the very core of who we are. Um, it's more than just a, a beating organ. It's way more than that. It's the most central part, symbolically, of who we are, the heart. Um, and I guess you could say it does kind of address the issue of, of our very sin, the place that our sin even is. It's the heart. It's a very central piece, the very inner, the most inner part of who we are, our very being itself in its most essential, simple elements. And you see in the Bible, it talks about a heart of stone versus a heart of flesh. A heart of stone is something that is dead. It's like the images that were created that are of stone and metal. They're dead. They can't, they can, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have a mouth, but they can't speak. It has no breath in it. It has no life in it. But a heart of flesh is what we were always meant to be. And that's coming back into what God had created us and intended for us to be. A circumcised heart is a heart that is committed to God. A heart that is hardened is a heart of stone. It's like Pharaoh. And a heart of stone refuses to submit to God. It cannot please Him. It will not surrender to him as being God. So with all of those ideas and, and images in mind, this is where our text comes from. Sin is so important to understand. And a lot of, I know I, there's a lot of preachers that are out there that just don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. <laughs> well, if you take that out of the equation, we don't need Jesus. You have to understand sin in order to understand what Jesus is doing. You have to understand that. And if you minimize it, you minimize his work also. All right, so here's our text. First slide. This is where we picked up. So verse, chapter 1, verse 5. And it says, this is the message that we have heard from him and we proclaim it to you so the herd part of it and this year those of you that weren't with us last week please don't think that what i post here a collection of crayons exploded on my <laughs> files here or that i got bored and just had a coloring spree um, what i share here and what i highlight i try to highlight in similar colors so that you can see patterns that are happening in the text. You can see um, a lot of scripture is very poetic. Even the narratives parts of them, even historical parts of them are still, they use patterns. And it's supposed to be so that you can remember things better because it was very oratory. It was very much as much, um, there were obviously people that wrote things down, but a lot of it was to be remembered. So it gave you the ability to remember things and patterns and so forth. And it's fascinating because sometimes where you might think, well, just being repetitive and saying the same thing, it's meant to be there to highlight certain things in the text. It's saying more through these patterns than just saying them for the sake of saying them. Anyways, so I highlight that. So this is the message, and he's talking about what he has learned from him who is the word of life, who is Jesus, from last week's message. This is the message that we heard from him, and we proclaim it to you. We share it to you. These two words, message and proclaim, is the same root. The word is angalia. Anglos, angels, is what that comes from. The message, messengers, angels, or messengers of God. This is the message 
that we have been given from him and we give it to you. God has given this to us. We give it to you. That God is light. And in him there is no darkness whatsoever. None. Light and darkness, John uses throughout all of his books that he wrote, especially the book of John. Uh, in fact, um, just in John, the uh, first uh, chapter of the book of John, of the Gospel of John, he says in verses 9 and 10, True light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him talking about Jesus. The light came into the darkness. The darkness is this world has fallen into darkness. Remember, at the very beginning, that's how the Bible starts. The world was dark. It was void. It was chaotic. There was nothing there. The Spirit of God hovered for the waters and the darkness. And what did God do on the very first day? He brought light into the darkness. He started to bring order into it. And we'll come back to that. But the point is, is this, that he is light. There is no, and the light is good, is what it says on that first day. No darkness whatsoever is in him. He is not evil, wicked, bad, deceptive at all. God is 100% good and true, trustworthy. That's so important because if we don't know that, we fall into the same pattern that Adam and Eve did. We can't trust God because he's got an ulterior motive. He said, don't do this. But instead of me saying he does, he says that for my own good. He is the tree of life. He is the, the very thing that I plug into and I get my life from him because he is life itself. If I decide to not trust him anymore, I unplug myself from him. And that's where death comes in. There's no darkness whatsoever in him at all. None. What we do with that statement is up to us. And I know people that tell me all the time where they say, you know, I know that God is good. And they say it with their mouth. But then they say, but. <laughs> and you, you do understand that whenever you say, but after whatever it is that you say, you pretty much nullify everything that was said before then. I know that I'm supposed to do this, but, <laughs> just erase it. But, I just keep thinking, what if? I mean, there was times before that he didn't act, and what if he does it again? What if? What if? We will never have a faith that God calls us into if we always are doubting his goodness. It's impossible. How could we? Why would we have that kind of faith if we think there's a possibility that he's not good? We won't, ever. We need to make sure we get that established first. If that's a problem that we have, we need to work through that. Why do we not trust God then? With whoever, a counselor, a, a disciple, a, a person that's discipling you, a, another Christian that knows God's word well. Walk through that. Why do you not believe that God is completely and totally true? His word continually over and over and over and over and over again says, I'm completely trustworthy, good, hesed, loving Faithfulness, covenant faithfulness, absolutely, completely, totally trustworthy. This is the message that we heard from him and we proclaim it to you. God is good. God is light. 100%. There's no darkness in him whatsoever. Not even a little tiny bit. None. There is a consequence either way. However, we want to perceive that, that phrase. Everything else falls into it. Today we're going to see that there's two slides, and there's a statement, and then what we do with that statement is up to us. So the next one in verse 6 says, if we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's an action. Our life has to have an action, right? Walking is an image of doing life. When Jesus says, follow me, walk with me, do life with me, fellowship with me, hang out with me. Walking is walking a path. We choose to walk down a path. In the Bible, in the wisdom literature, it talks about a good path and a path of evil. The way of God versus the way of the world. The path that we choose to walk on is determines how we also position ourselves with God. It's not a matter of earning anything. Ultimately, what it does is it comes down to a matter of faith and surrender. It's an issue of surrender. If we surrender to God, knowing that he is in the light, I want to be with God. If I want to walk with God, then I have to decide that I'm going to do right. I'm going to be a person of good. If that's who he is, then I'm going to have to decide in my head, that's who I want to be. It's not earning anything. It's a surrender. I surrender to the light. I surrender to what is good. It is an action. If we walk in the light, then we have fellowship with God. And then it says, and Jesus' blood cleanses us from all evil. I had a guy, some of you have heard this story before. I was counseling a guy that was in a gang in Chicago. And a tough guy is one of the guys that had tattoos that you knew meant that they had killed somebody. And he had told me many times, um, I've done a lot of really evil things. Um, and he had a lot of demons um, at work on him because of that. But he had said, we were, we were going through some of, of some of actually talking about this very stuff that we talked about today. And he just got it. And he goes, he goes, that, that would be, if, if we're trying to walk in the light, if we want to be with God, but yet we still decide to walk in darkness, that's like trying to be part of two different gangs. He goes, that's stupid. That's a death sentence. You take neither side. And, and, you, and you, yet at the same point, you try to be on both sides. He says, you're definitely going to die. You don't have any protection. You choose to walk the, the, in between the line. You have to choose a side one way or the other. And I'm like, he gets it. He gets it. It's exactly what it is. Got to choose a side. Most of us want to get into heaven, yet at the same point, we don't want to really walk like God is um, we haven't surrendered and then we're like why is life so hard why is Christianity so hard because we allow for a battle to come into us in a way that we've never we haven't even taken a side yet we walk on both sides of, of the war and the battle is raging right in our heart in our very being We need to choose a side. This issue with set, uh, sin it says, so if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's the first time sin comes into this picture here. The next slides are going to be all about sin. It's going to explain what this last line is. What it's saying is, is this. We're still sinful beings. We're never going to be perfect. So there's going to be times even when we decide that I'm going to decide to be in the light, to walk in the light because I want to be with God. There's going to be times that we're still going to slip up. There's going to be times that we're going to fall. We're not going to be perfect. And that's where it says, it's in those places that Jesus, his blood on the cross cleanses us from all sin. That's what God gives us. That's grace. 
We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us. Because we have put our faith in him. We've surrendered to him. It's not going to be perfect. But he, let me put it this way. If I'm walking, if I say, if this is the path, <laughs> I used to say these two things. So, you know what? I'll play here to, to, to this. If one side is going to Madison, all right, and we'll say that's the good path. That's the way of God. The other one's to Chicago. Yes, I'll throw my hometown under the bus there. And that's the way of evil. If I say I'm going to Madison, but I'm walking to Chicago, I live a lie. Am I getting to Madison? No, I'm on the wrong path. Repentance is realizing I'm walking the wrong path. I turn and I change my direction. That's repenting, changing. Those that decide to walk the path of God, surrender, put their faith in Him, He gives us grace. We get forgiveness of our sins when we fall off the horse, when we stray off the path, when we have moments of weakness, then God takes us up and He dusts us off. There's still consequences for those sins. However, He dusts us off and gets us back on the path. We have a choice. All right, so moving to the next slide. So this one here. Again, this is more of the first statement, and it has to do with words. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let's jump down to the bottom here. This is what's called a chiastic structure. I'm not trying to impress you with big words. I'm trying to show you what this is because this is used a lot in Scripture. This would show eight would be A, 10 would also be A, but it'd be like A1, A2. These are in parallel with each other. B would be 9, and that's where you see this triangle effect, this moving in towards the central point. It's not hard to figure it out. You see these lines that they parallel once another. If we say we have sinned, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us, is not in us, is not in us. If we say, so the different things are truth and his word, God's word is truth. If we claim we have no sin or that we haven't sinned, and this is one of the heresies that John was battling, he was confronting in his letter, that some were saying that their high intellect and the knowledge that they have made it so that they were not sinful anymore. I've heard some of my people, some of my friends, my people, my people, have said, um, people that I know have said that, well, I don't sin. Well, you are the only person then in this world that doesn't sin. I am honored to meet you. All of us sin. That's part of being a human. Because after Adam, we all fell into sin. All of us. That's the problem. That's why we got the Bible, because God is trying to direct us back into how He's correcting this problem. What is He doing to save us from sin? If we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Fellowship. We're not one with the truth. We don't walk in truth. If we say we haven't sinned, then we make God out to be a liar, because everything in God's Word is telling us that we've all sinned. And if you want an Old Testament scripture passage, it's Ecclesiastes verse, chapter 7, verse 20. It says, surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. There's not one. In the New Testament, it's Romans 3, 23. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But if we confess our sins, if we admit, if we surrender to God's word, trusting that it is trustworthy, we confess 
those sins to Him. We hold them up and we confess them to Him. It says He is faithful. Why? Because His Word tells us that He will forgive us for our sins. He is faithful, faithful. He's trustworthy and just. He's good to forgive us for those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How? Through Jesus' blood. If we say with our mouth and claim things that go against His Word, we're on our own. The truth is not in us. We don't have that fellowship. But if we confess our sins and surrender to God and say, this is my sin, forgive me, please, help me, we repent. We've been walking this way. I have a niece. This is a favorite story of mine. I have a niece that when she was, it was many years ago, but when she was really young, just learning to walk and to talk and stuff, and she's getting out of diapers and stuff, and she comes up in front of my mom, who is her grandmother, and she hasn't got any pants on. She her diapers off, and she, she just walks right up to her mother and my mother that are standing there, and she says, I potty my pants. I'm sorry. And she walked off. <laughs> and her mom goes, no, you're not. Get back here. I'm hot in my pants. I'm sorry. And she walks off. That's the way I think of many Christians. God, I'm hot in my pants. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And we go back. Right? Forgive me so I can get back in and do what I was doing before. That's not repentance. It's not what God calls us into. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all the righteousness. So the next slide, please. And here's what He says. My little children, I'm writing these things to you. This is my little children. It shows you the compassion that this older teacher has for his students, for his disciples. My children, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. I'm telling you all this so that you don't sin. But even if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. The word means helper. It's the same word that Jesus talks about in John 17, John 14 through 17 in his farewell address when he says that I will send you another helper, the Holy Spirit, to come. He's just like me. A helper. It's also what was given to Adam. A helper. Fellowship. Unity. Oneness. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate. We have a helper with the Father. Jesus Christ. The righteous. He who is righteous cleanses us from righteousness by his own blood. He is the propitiation. The word propitiation it means an appeasement of an offended party. Payment to settle debt. He is the payment that we deserve. He takes that upon himself. He's the only one ultimately that has the capital to be able to pay the debt that we have. But he's willing. He is the propitiation of our, for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is not a universal pardon for everyone. The pardon could atone for every person in the world if they did turn to God, but we know by God's word that they won't. It's for those who turn to God, who repent, who change, who surrender to this one who was given as a helper to choose to be part of the light and not the darkness anymore. God's wrath is averted not by an external gift, but by his own self-giving to die the death of sinners so that they might live in In him. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Is this whole idea of living in God. The second part, these last 
two frames, these two passages here. It's an issue of faith. Are we willing to believe God's word? Because God's word guides us into life. It did at the beginning also in Genesis 3. Before that, when he said, don't eat from this tree. That was to help keep us in life. Now this is to lead us back into life out of death. Do we trust that his word is for our benefit? It has no ulterior motive other than for us to come back into what we were always meant to be. He gives us the ability to not only conquer sin, death, because we will rise even when we die physically by the same power that God has rose Jesus from the dead. Don't want to do that again. <laughs> it's in the terms of an agreement. Whenever you get a new software, right, you always have this little checkbox on the bottom. You agree to the terms of the agreement. And often what do we do? We just scroll right through. Why? Because it's this like huge list. And we just... Yes, I do. But God makes it very clear. There are terms for this agreement. It's not a matter of us earning anything. Again, we are saved by grace through faith. That's what Ephesians tells us, right? But faith, what is faith? If we believe in something, we walk in it. We follow it. According to God, you don't intellectually understand something, but then go and do something different. Your life, the overflow of what your life is, testifies to what you believe in your heart. If your life is telling something different from what your mouth is saying, your life is what speaks louder than your words to God. Again, it's not a matter of being perfect. If we surrender to God, what we start to find is that it's easier and easier to do the things that maybe were harder to do. The people that always, they say to me, Christianity is so hard. Oh, it's so hard. I want to be nice to people. I just can't. I'm so dumb. <laughs> so frustrating. When we decide to surrender to God and trust Him, what we start to find is that He starts to change our heart. Even the people that we don't like, that really don't like us, that really make life difficult for us, we still find, we see them, and there's a part of us that wants to strangle them. And there's another part, though, that's in us, that's in our heart, that we recognize that this person also is a child of God. It might be a warped image and likeness of God, but they do have his image and likeness. <clears throat> and God gives us a different heart. That spirit in us that he gives us, that wind, the breath, the life, starts to work in us and change us from the inside. It's not a matter of trying. I've read books on how to be a nicer person. When we surrender to God, he starts to work from within and it overflows. We start to find ourselves saying, I don't know what's wrong with me, but all of a sudden I start, I, so I've heard people, and I've done it before, where I'm like, I never used to be this way, but all of a sudden God's just giving me like all the emotions that I don't know what to do with them sometimes, you know? He changes us. When we change our path, He changes our life. He changes our heart. It's a heart thing. It's a surrender thing. It's a faith thing. I want to read in conclusion here, Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning, this is how the book starts, by In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Darkness. 
And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. God's word, this is truth, he said, let there be light. You can put the last slide up. I want that to be up while I'm reading this. Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And here's the key point. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness called night. And there was evening and morning in the first day. God separated the light from the darkness. He did that with his people in the Exodus. He separated them from the people of Egypt. Jesus separates the people that follow him from the people of the world. He calls them out to come into the light, out of the darkness, to have fellowship with the light and become light. And it actually says in the book of John in 3, 19 through 21, and this is the judgment. This is right after John 3, 16, right? God so loved the world that he sent his only son. It says, this is the judgment. This, this is the part of scripture that everybody skips. Yet it's essential to understand. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world. And people loved darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. They loved the light, the darkness, more than the light, even though the light came into the world for their own good. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works, works should be exposed, because it exposes our sinfulness. God being God in our lives, hurts human pride. Because if God is God in our lives, guess who doesn't get to have things the way where they want them? Us. It says, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. They come to the light. They're transformed by the light so that the light can shine through them and glow through them and glorify God. That's what we're called to be. Light in the darkness. We're designed to do ministry with God. That's what he wants to do. He doesn't need us, but he calls us into it. He wants to do it with us and through us. Surrender to Jesus Christ as King and faith in God's Word is what gives us fellowship with God. It's all about surrender. It's the hardest part about being a Christian is surrender. But once we got that down, we start finding ourselves doing ministry with God and He starts changing us. We don't need to read all of the books, the five ways to be a better Christian. We can stop reading the books of five ways to be a better giver or a better husband or a better wife or whatever it is. They're all out there, right? I mean, you see them everywhere. Top ten ways to be able to do this. Top five ways to be able to do that. Surrender to Christ and the Holy Spirit will start moving us. Believe it or not, those books, before those books, God was doing just fine. wants to glorify himself through us. This is an awesome thing. How can you keep that in? So, on that note, let's pray and we're going to sing one more song and we will uh, bring it into this service. So, Father God, we, we thank you for this message. We thank you for your word. And we, um, we ask that you would let this word sink into each of our hearts that you would move us into a place of surrender and that you would allow for your light to glow through us, to help us to become more and more and more in the light and enjoy the fellowship you give us access to through your Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.
All right. So please stand as we sing this final song.
and help us to overcome all of the obstacles that stand in front of us and glorify your name and call other people into it. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Before we go, I just want to um, share with you, we have got, um, we've got a new location that we're looking at, which is not far from here, so don't worry. Um, we are working right now to uh, do our services at the Dodge Theater in Dodgeville. So it'll be right downtown, right in the Dodge Theater. Um, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool layout. If you haven't been there before, it's nice, comfortable chairs. That's usually a big deal to, to people who haven't seen chairs for a while. Um, there are some technological issues right now with some of the projector things and some, some um, we think that we'll be there next week and we're planning on being there next week. However, if we're not there, we will be here. We will verify that through anything in social media. So our webpage, we will verify wherever we're gonna be. Uh, we will have things that go out on Facebook. We will have things go out on Instagram. If you need to know, just reach out to us, whether it be a call, whether it be as far as a message on Instagram, Facebook, any of that stuff, or an email, and we will get back to you to verify. We are planning on being at the Dodge Theater this Sunday. Okay, so same time at 9 o'clock. It's a lot of fun. Got a huge screen, tons of room. <laughs> Or whatever, whether it be just fun or social distancing or whatever it is, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're excited about it, and they are excited to have us. So um, we hope to be there next week. If not, we will be back here for sure. This will be the place that we come back to and, until we get that stuff figured out. So go in the love, the power, and the light of Jesus Christ this week. May you be blessed, and we hope to see you again next week. God bless. Thank mm -hmm. you.